get away with it. Good morning. It is great to see everybody here today. A special welcome to some of our friends from Burford United Church. Actually, there's quite a few of you here today. Uh, and uh, we indeed welcome you and are glad you are with us. Uh, let us gather in this time together knowing that as a people, uh, a disciples of Jesus Christ, we gather indeed in the light of his love. together to share in the praises of our creating God. Yet how can we adequately describe the creator of the universe? In faith, we will praise the Lord. Oh God, how wonderful you are. We come to tell each other how wonderful our awesome God is. Yet as we respond to God's glory, there are not sufficient words. Even so, we will praise the Lord. Oh God, how glorious you are. God's creative spirit draws us together to share in worship and praise of our almighty God, who continues to breathe life into all creation. God is robed in light, honor, and majesty, and has laid the foundation of this universe as a mirror image of God's own unchanging nature. How amazing is our God. Yes, we will praise and worship our God. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Praise be to you, O God, for the wonders of your creation. You spin the shining stars and stretch out the seas to the foot furthest horizon. You lift the curtain of dawn so light can chase away the night. You give the earth its seasons and each creature its lifespan, breathing life and love into each precious soul. And so we come this day to praise you knowing human greatness is a mere shadow of yours. In this hour of worship, breathe your spirit into us once more to inspire us to serve you with creativity and commitment and with the honesty and humility we meet in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, you call us to walk your way in the world, to serve our neighbors and love our enemies. And we confess these are not easy choices for us. We sometimes turn a blind eye to a neighbor in need. We like to follow the crowd rather than challenge popular opinions. Forgive us, Jesus, for seeking an easier way than your way. Unclog our ears and tenderize our hearts so that your words enliven our discipleship, so that we put the needs of others before our own so that we share what we have rather than hoarding it for ourselves and use our gifts to benefit others rather than increasing our own status and position. Lord Jesus Christ, keep reminding us that following you means emptying ourselves of all self-serving power and filling ourselves with the desire to serve others as willingly as you did. Forgive any reluctance on our part to follow your example and replace any selfish power plays of ours with your inclusive love, your compassion, and your humility. These prayers we offer in your name and for your sake. Amen. Friends, rejoice and be glad when you hear the good news because God loves us. We lack for nothing. Because God forgives us, we have everything we need. Because God surrounds us with sisters and brothers, we do not journey alone. Committing everything to God, trusting in the one who redeems us, we decide to live as God's faithful and forgiven people. Let us listen now for God's word for us as we read from the Gospel according to Mark chapter 10. And this uh, passage from Mark is entitled, Jesus Teaches About Serving Others. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request? He asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking. 
Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left, for God has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. For whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. This indeed is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. May all praise be unto him now and forevermore. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know it's hard to imagine, but in just a few short weeks, we will begin to see People in uniforms, in shopping malls, and in storefronts, ringing bells, collecting donations in their kettles to help with outreach for people in need. In fact, the Salvation Army has progressed over the years, and you can even do tap now to make a donation. But it's interesting to note that in 1878, when the Salvation Army was really beginning to make its mark, men and women from all over the world began to join their ranks. 
A man who had once dreamed of becoming a bishop in another denomination crossed the Atlantic from America to England to enlist in the Salvation Army instead. And his name was Samuel Brangle. Brangle left a fine pastorate to join William Booth's army. And at first, General Booth accepted his services reluctantly and grudgingly. Booth said to Brangle, you've been your own boss for way too long. So in order to instill humility in Brangle, he made him work by cleaning the boots of other trainees. Discouraged, Brangle said to himself, have I followed my own fancy across the Atlantic in order to blacken boots? Then, as in a vision, he saw Jesus bending over the feet of rough, uneducated fishermen. Lord, he whispered, you washed their feet, so I will blacken their shoes. Samuel Brangle went on to establish the Salvation Army in North America. And at the time of his death, the Salvation Army was thriving in both the United States and in Canada. And just before his death, Brangle sent out a short memo to all of his top leaders. And this memo had one single word written on it. Others. Well, this story reminds me of the wise words penned by Albert Schweitzer once that said, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found a way to serve. But we all know that the reality of our culture today is that we live in a world where the quest for greatness has become almost obsessive. John Vandelar in his commentary on today's passage asserts that reality television offers the promise of fame and wealth to anyone willing to put themselves out there. Everything from corporations to churches to individuals is measured by the size of buildings, bank accounts, or networks. And while the growth of social media has connected us as never before, it has also created a whole new competition for greatness as we strive for ever increasing numbers of friends or followers or visitors. But this desire to be special or exceptional is not new. But in our gospel reading for today, Jesus defines greatness differently. The disciples had heard Jesus talk about God's reign for quite some time, but they still just didn't get it. Even after hearing Jesus predict his death more than once, James and John still thought that the glory Jesus spoke of would be about power and wealth and recognition. And they wanted some of that. So one day they went and asked Jesus for the best seats at his side as advisors to the monarch of God's reign. Jesus, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you one on your right and the other on your left. Imagine how they must have dreamed of the praise they would receive and the special treatment they would enjoy. But even though they thought they had managed to get in before any of the other disciples, Jesus told them that those places were already reserved. What they didn't know was that when Jesus spoke about thrones and crowns, he meant the cross where he would be mocked as king of the Jews and would wear a crown of thorns. This is where God's glory would be revealed. The glory of following Jesus is not in receiving special treatment, not from God nor anyone else. 
but rather it is in sharing in the life-giving sacrifice of Jesus. It is in making our lives matter by participating in God's mission in the world. It is in learning that the true joy in life is not to be served, but to give oneself in service to others that is meaningful and that leaves the world a better place. Reverend Dr. David Lowe asserts that the reign of God in God's kingdom is found where power is demonstrated through service, greatness is shown in vulnerability, and achievement comes through compassion toward others. Can you imagine with me for just a moment what the world would be like today if our leaders behaved just like that? Vying with each other to see who could best see it serve the needs of the vulnerable? Holding debates about the best way of coming in last so that others could come in first? It seems rather absurd when you talk about it like that. But more simply, what if we lived like this? Measuring our achievements not in terms of dollars or possessions, but in terms of the lives we have touched, or assessing our net worth not in terms of bank accounts, but in terms of acts of compassion. Suddenly, when you look at this passage that way, it's far from being absurd. In fact, it's incredibly accessible for the truth that Jesus calls us to as his disciples is that anyone can serve another. From young to old, from powerful to vulnerable, from rich to poor, from educated or not, anyone can act with kindness, put others first, and try to exercise compassion to those around them. There's a wonderful story about three trees who were talking in the forest one day about their dreams for the future. The first tree said it would like to be made a cradle so that it might go on living as support for the fragile life of a tiny new baby. The second tree wanted to be made into a big ship so that it might go on living, carrying important cargo and influential people to exotic new lands. The third tree longed to stay right where it was, existing only as a tree, but growing even taller, pointing ever higher to remind everyone that there is a God in heaven who loves them. Those were their dreams. One wanted to be a cradle, one a mighty ship, and one a tall tree pointing people to God. But then one day the woodcutters came and chopped down the three trees and destroyed their dreams. The first tree was not made into a cradle, but into a simple feeding trough, a manger for animals. But the manger was sold to a family in Bethlehem, and on the night Jesus was born, that simple feed box became the cradle for the Christ child. The second tree was built into a boat, but not the kind it had dreamed of, not a mighty ocean-going vessel, but a tiny, inexpensive fishing boat. A man named Simon Peter bought the boat. And on one warm afternoon when the crowds pressed in, Jesus himself climbed aboard that small fishing boat that he might preach good news to the multitudes. The third tree was also deprived of its dream. It wanted to remain standing tall and pointing to God. Instead, it was cut down and shaped into a horrible instrument of torture, a cross. But it was on that very cross that Jesus was crucified transforming a symbol of cruelty into a powerful reminder of God's eternal love for all people. The three trees were humbled, but in the plan of God, in their service, they were exalted. And so too it is for us, my friends, when in faith, through serving others with our very lives, God works through us and for us to bring about his kingdom of justice and peace for all. For whoever, says Jesus, wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave of everyone else. 
For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. I'd like to leave you today with a reading that was shared at our Horseshoe Falls Regional Council meeting this past weekend that Petra, who is our lay rep for Bethel and myself attended virtually, of course. Our president, Reverend Robert Lawson, invited us as the church in the world to be brave and to be bold. To be brave and to be bold disciples of Jesus Christ. And he said sometimes that means allowing the empty places in ourselves or the hollowness, as he called it, to be filled with the only thing that can fill us, Jesus Christ. Diane Matheson Jimenez, Minister for Social Justice for the region, ended our meeting with these words I'd like to share with you, and they are written by Clarissa Pincola Estes, and they are entitled, We Are Made for These Times. They were written quite a while ago, but I think they're actually rather fitting following the last 18 months that we have lived through. These words are a reminder of our calling as disciples of Jesus Christ in the world, as we empty ourselves and allow Jesus' spirit to propel us in humility, that we might live out our faith one small act at a time. She writes, My friends, do not lose heart. We are made for these times. I've heard from so many recently who are deeply and properly bewildered. They are concerned about the state of affairs in our world now. Ours is a time of almost daily astonishment and often righteous rage over the latest degradations of what matters most to civilized visionary people. In any dark time, there is a tendency to veer toward fainting over how much is wrong or unmended in our world. Do not focus on that. There is a tendency too to fall into being weakened by dwelling on what is outside your reach by what, you, what cannot yet be. Do not focus there. We are needed. That is all we can know. And though we meet resistance, we more so will meet great souls who will hail us, love us, and guide us. And we will know them when they appear. Didn't you say you were a believer? Didn't you say you pledged to listen to a voice greater? Didn't you ask for grace? Don't you remember that to be in grace means to submit to the voice that is greater? Ours is not the task of fixing the entire world all at once, but of stretching out to mend the part of the world that is within our reach. Any small, calm thing that one soul can do to help another soul to assist some portion of this poor, suffering world will help immensely. It is not given to us to know which acts or by whom will cause the critical mass to tip toward an enduring good. What is needed for dramatic change is accumulation of acts. Adding, adding to, adding more, and continuing. We know that it does not take everyone on earth to bring justice and peace, but only a small determined group who will not give up during the first, second, or hundredth gale. One of the most calming and powerful actions you can do to intervene in a stormy world is to stand up and show your soul. Soul on deck shines like gold in dark times. The light of the soul throws sparks and can send up flares. Build signal fires, causes proper matters to catch fire to display the lantern of soul in shadowy times like these, to be fierce and to show mercy toward others, both are acts of immense bravery and greatest necessity. Struggling souls catch light from other souls who are fully lit and willing to show it. If you would help to calm the tumult, this is one of the strongest things that you can do. There will always be times when you feel discouraged, 
I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. The reason is this. In my uttermost bones, I know something as do you. It is that there can be no despair when you remember why you came to earth, who you serve, and who sent you here. The good words we say and the good do deeds we do are not ours. They are the words and deeds of the one who brought us here. In that spirit, I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in the harbor and moored, it is safe, there can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Friends, as the, Paul reminded the Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others, and let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at, who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Friends, may this truth be so in your life, and in mine. Amen and amen. Scriptures remind us how much we depend on God's goodness, 
And Jesus invites us to put others' needs before our own, to serve in the world as he did in humility. Our offering is one way we offer God our thanks for all that we have received, and one way we can serve those who depend on our kindness as well as upon God's. So as we receive our morning offering this morning, let us pray. Great and gracious God, we offer you these gifts, small tokens of our love for you. Bless them with the power of your Holy Spirit so they may accomplish more than we could ever ask or imagine. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our friend. Amen. And may I suggest, this is a long song, multiple verses. May I suggest us women folk carry the verse, the first verse and the third. Our gentlemen will carry the second and the fourth. And then we'll all come together on the fifth and the sixth. So women, we're going to get started and it starts fast. Two bars. and Scott for leading us in our uh, music today. Annie is away up north for the weekend and um, we are just so grateful uh, to Petra and Scott and Annie for picking up our music leadership uh, this fall and uh, it's indeed a, indeed a gift from God. So thank you. I invite us now into a time of prayer and I invite you this morning uh, to participate in this prayer as I ask the words of petition, God in your deep mercy, I invite you to respond with the words, hear our prayer. And so as we begin, as we gather in prayer this day, God in your deep mercy, hear our prayer. God of each and every life, you open our eyes on the world you love to show us your presence and your purpose in all creation. We thank you for the wonders of the seasons as they change and for the gifts of love and compassion you offer us through friend and stranger. We pray for the earth as it struggles to support your many creatures. Make us better stewards in creation and kinder neighbors to both friend and stranger. God, in your deep mercy, hear our prayer. 
God of justice, you open our eyes on the world to show us struggle and conflict. We see the burdens many are carrying and the way differences create division. We pray for all those still struggling with the economic impact of the pandemic and for those feeling the stress of these days in deeply personal ways. Show us how to support those in difficulty, those who struggle both physically and mentally and spiritually, and help us to mend relationships in our community. God, in your deep mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, you open our eyes on the world to show us suffering and despair. We see challenges for health care all around us and know many still face the effects of COVID-19 or other illnesses and complications that make life hard to cope with. We pray for those who suffer here and in so many places in the world you love. Give strength and compassion to all who wait, who offer treatment and courage and hope to all who wait for healing in their lives. God, in your deep mercy, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, you open our eyes on the world to show us its complexities. We see countries locked in old animosities and communities overwhelmed by fresh upheaval. We pray for the millions displaced in current conflicts and by natural disasters, and for leaders here and around the world. Open their eyes to the suffering of the earth and those in their jurisdictions and open all of our eyes to ways we can participate in solutions to situations which break your heart and ours. God, in your deep mercy, hear our prayer. And so, O oh God, now we pray for your kingdom to come. In the words Jesus taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, forever and ever.
Friends, go in peace, love and care for one another in Christ's name. Go in the confidence of people who have found mercy through him, keeping the commandments and letting go of all that binds you in the ways of this world. And may God come close to you and keep you safe. May Christ Jesus reward your faithfulness a hundredfold. And may the Holy Spirit be your help in time of need, both now and forevermore.